Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with Spending Time, the Blog to Watch podcast. I am joined by a few additional team members. Uh, I have myself, I have Bilal Khan, and I have Zach Pinya. Hey guys. Hey, how's it going? So this is the first three-person show we've done. I hope it doesn't get a little out of control. It's our first threesome. Um, and we're also going to split the show into three parts. We're, we're testing a new format, and this is something that we've wanted to do for a while. I mean, we're excited about spending time, and there's a lot of different directions we can go with it. Bilal, you are probably among us the, the podcast enthusiast, and for the longest time I've said that I think that there's a, a conversation about watches that, that we want to have that people like. Um, I think it's a great way for a lot of our audience to engage when they're on the go and things like that. How, how, how do you sort of incorporate podcasts into your life in general? I listen to podcasts when I'm basically doing anything. I list, I've got about, you know, 15 podcasts that I'm subscribed to and, you know, they're, they each basically have a, a podcast out every week and that, and they're about an hour long each. So it really adds up, but it's become how I get most of my news, my commentary on culture and things that I'm interested in. Um, I think that there's a lot of space for a watch enthusiast podcast um and there's a few of them and and we've done them before we've done it before i mean i i started podcasting about watches oh my god like almost 10 years ago now i think it was in 2009 or something like that i started doing uh our time with john biggs and there wasn't anything there was no watch podcast at the time um and then if you came about came aboard zach what about you are you a podcast guy yeah, absolutely. I was curious to hear what you guys listen to outside of the watch space because I find um, I get a little bit too hyper focused on just watches all day, every day. It starts yeah. to get a little dreary. So I've been listening to uh, um, a few different things. I've got some 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 podcasts kind of in the bike world that I'm interested in. Um, outside Magazine has an amazing like adventure uh, podcast that's cool. It kind of balances between like survival and 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 some of their correspondence stuff, which is super cool. Um, there's a really good there's a really good cast called uh, the Habitat, which is kind of about that Mars mission that uh, is happening or just happened, uh, simulated Mars mission in Hawaii, um, which is also amazing. It's been, kind of covers the psychological effects on on humans in this like long term study where they they basically just stranded like six or eight strangers, I think, um, in a simulated Mars environment on this volcano in Hawaii, just to see what would happen. Fascinating stuff. Uh, what are you guys listening to though? Curious to hear. I listen to a lot of <laughs> podcasts, like all the Crooked Media podcasts. So that's like four or five of them. Like yeah, Crooked's great. America. I listen to the, the Daily. Um, I really liked S Town. That was more of like a narrative podcast. So it was like uh-huh. short story. Um, I like Serial a lot. Um, I listen to the NPR podcast, the Five Thirty Eight podcast. A lot of politics for me. A lot of politics. <laughs> Which I'm gonna stay away from in this. You know. I, you know what's really good? I have to this is this is more just a shout to kind of who I was uh, five to ten years ago or whatever. But there's a great podcast called Washed Up Emo. Um, <laughs> it's all of these it's all of these front men from from basically like punk and emo bands from uh, you know the nineties and the early aughts who are no longer in those bands. It's kind of like a where are they now? It's super interesting. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it's really good. So I I listen not to podcasts. I'm the weird one that doesn't. Um, I just mostly listen to books. So it's basically the same thing. You know, I'm listening to information that's, you know, not per se entertainment. Well, I guess it's entertaining, but it's information. Um, I'm just sort of in this thing right now where I prefer to be distilled into a book or like a university lecture. Um, so for me, it's actually a little bit less important at this point in my life to know exactly like the most current events and I'm looking for a sort of like a little bit more uh, academic analysis like after something has been you know investigated I love yeah yeah so that's that's yeah. my thing um I think that the reason that we continue to get so excited about watch podcasts is that us as a team we'll sit around having conversations and I keep thinking to myself, boy, this would be entertaining to someone else. Or, boy, I wish yeah. there was someone else to hear this because they would want to know it. Especially since, like, in a way, it's not just our job is to give advice on buying watches. But we're on scene. We we know things that doesn't necessarily come through in writing or pictures. It's really only opinion. And I feel that that would help 
people understand really what our takeaway impressions are of these products and events. I mean, all of us have been at events and we're like, boy, I wish I was recording the situation, right? Yeah, yeah. And we, we can sometimes, not all the time. Um, what do you think is, I'll just, I don't want to say missing the most, but what is, what is some of the things that the audience, just by virtue of the fact that they're not where we are and going to the events, what are they missing that would truly have them change the way they respond to us, the way they understand the information? Uh, you know what I mean? I think... I think um, no, go for it, Blah. Um, just quickly, I think... Um, the interaction with the larger watch world, the brands, the conglomerates, um, how we experience their new products, um, how we have to sometimes, you know, struggle for some information here or there. Um, if the audience, I think, saw that part of it, they would be like, oh, wow, this is not as um, cut and dry mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. it may seem when we present it, because obviously, you know, our presentation of these new watches, et cetera, is incredibly polished always but there's a lot that I'm, I'm gonna give a perfect happens. example we'll write a hands-on about a watch and we won't have like the case thickness and people are like mm -hmm. how dare you you missed this crucial <laughs> information I'm like okay okay Which, i agree you know, the yeah, brand didn't didn't mention this audience, information and i didn't happen yeah. to have my ruler on me i'm sorry exactly although you know that's a case where that information like the audience should expect that information but unfortunately, sometimes we are not in the position to to have it for them. And that's, you know, it's a, a frustrating experience for us as well. Like, we'll be in a I was, was definitely okay, going to chime in on that in how um, the, the speed at which you have to look at everything and get your notes and uh, shoot photographs and do all of this insightful stuff in such a short window um, with, a, with a, a, a large amount of product. And then carry that down the line, you know, 12 to 15 different appointments throughout the day um, presents a pretty, pretty unique set of challenges. I think one thing that would be really interesting for the, for the community to kind of uh, have a chance to get some insight into is the immediate, like, visceral reaction um, to seeing a lot of these products firsthand for the first time. <laughs> you walk into the room, um, you know, the, the, the rep you know, always wants to show Ariel, like, give them the pitch, and Ariel's just like, no, just just open the trays, put everything out on the table, <laughs> show me all the stuff all at once. It's like a Facebook Live thing. And, and it's it's interesting to see kind of what that what that actual reaction is. I mean, there's a lot of stuff where it's where our reaction is genuinely, oh wow, this is this is gonna this is gonna change things versus oh boy, these people like we have to sit here and tell people that their baby is not pretty. <laughs> yeah, like sometimes they say like, and this is the model we're hoping does really well this year. And then we're like, look at each other we're like, uh... <laughs> maybe next year, guys. <laughs> yeah, um, I, 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 yeah, I think that sort of initial reaction stuff is good, as, as well as some of the banter. And, you know, there's these people at the brands that really truly care about their product and are impressed with it and others are just trying to slide it over like here here it is where's my coffee <laughs> and i think that it's enthusiasm from the people the brands that can make a giant difference a I giant agree. difference absolutely. absolutely agree um where where have uh, we been lately travel wise and where is it that we are going the last trip i was on was to Couture with Zach in Vegas which is basically like you know, it's... Bilal and Zach in Vegas. That's basically what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, Couture, for those who don't know, is a big show in Vegas. Um, it basically acts as a follow-up to SIHH and Basel World, um, albeit at a slower pace, um, because <laughs> these watches are not new anymore. They were all shown previously. Um, I like it because it allows a bit extra time with these new pieces that we were not able to really spend over 25 seconds with during the hectic nature of SIHH and Basel. Um, I believe Couture is the only big watch show in, in the States, right? I can't, like, there are some smaller enthusiast shows, but at that scale with brands, I think it's the only one. Well, it's, it's, you know, I think what people need to remember, these shows were primarily jewelry it's shows. Trade. Yeah, it's a trade. And they, yeah, yeah but, but for jewelry. And they're still yeah. primarily yeah. for jewelry. JCK and Couture are primarily jewelry shows. Couture has tried to shift 
a lot of its focus to watches, but what it finds is that there are just not that many retailers out there that sell watches compared to jewelry, and a lot of them have already done their business at at, at SIHH and Basel World, so they don't necessarily always have to come. So it's it's really about making sure that there's enough of a market to handle these things. And, and I, look, I, I want there to be more in America. But again, these brands are small. They only have so many people to travel around. They only have so much news and things like that. So I, I think that the U.S. deserves um, a bigger one. I mean, look, Watches and Wonders. You know, I was there in Miami in February when this show that the last iteration was in Hong Kong now comes uh, came to America wasn't really a trade show it was more like a consumer event uh, you know in Miami which was interesting so they're 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 trying they're trying um so that so okay so that was good for you guys uh did you see any products that you hadn't seen before that you're excited about anything new I think the US only Grand Seiko watches were probably the only thing that we saw that was new um they look pretty cool how were they they're pretty cool I think I think you know they they are in small batches i think like 300 of the steel model and like 50 50 of the platinum and the road gold right zach was that it yeah yeah it was 350 and 50 yeah so I, you know i um i'm more a fan of of their gmts as as uh Bilal can attest to with <laughs> me just whining about gmts pretty much for three days straight but every um, it's it is nice to see uh, the U.S. market finally get recognized with a few exclusives. I think to now, Grand Seiko's exclusives being limited to um, Asia or to Japan. There's been some really, really cool stuff, but it's just super hard to bring back here to the States. N- those three models were definitely the most newsworthy thing of the show. I wouldn't I wouldn't personally try to own any of them, whereas there are a few uh, Japan-only limited editions that I, I definitely would chase after. But uh, I think those three were not that, that. They were good-looking, though. I guess kind of the sad reality of the Japanese brands with Citizen, Casio, and Seiko, I would say the majority of the time if there's an awesome limited edition I want, it, yeah, it's a, it's a Japan-only model. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. so so rarely do these ones I like actually come out of Japan. They do. They do. And, you know, I was, and, and speaking of Grand Seiko, I, I like Grand Seiko. I think they need to get a little bit more serious with their sports watches. You know, I have the... Um, affordable sports watches. Affordable sports watches. But, you know, oh, my, my GMT... Mm-hmm. My Spring Drive GMT, like that model came out like I, I think more than ten years ago now, yeah. or about ten yeah. years ago, and like that's still yeah. one of my favorite ones. Like, um, so yeah, so it's a it's a great brand, but I think that as they have they set their sights higher, they need to rethink their their design. Um, I don't even know what to call it, sort of their design philosophy. Right. Yeah, and I, I would agree. I would agree with that. And the thing is, is like, to their credit, they have done they've done an admirable job of maintaining like a singular kind of design aesthetic um, throughout their line. But I also think like to their detriment, um, it's starting to look and feel a little bit dated. And and to your to your point, I mean that that model. Uh, and I'm I'm allergic to reference numbers, so I'm not going to quote Me reference too. numbers throughout this entire conversation. But um, that particular model with the rotating bezel that you have, GMT, you know, it comes sans bezel as well. But like both of those variants uh, have essentially been in the collection, yeah, for the better part of the last decade. And and uh, they do have a couple. You know, they have like that dressier version um, that I think is water resistant to only 50 meters, which again is super classic. And and to me is is probably the preferable one um, within that collection but um, not really a true sports watch so yeah I, I, I agree they, they, they definitely need kind of a breath of fresh air and it's funny because when you ask for a breath of fresh air in their sports watches then we get that ceramic and titanium piece that they introduced at Basel this year which is just like so far over the mark for a lot of people where it's <laughs> you can't just inch across the line they have to they have to just completely send it and uh, that's a little bit too much for me yeah, and we can probably keep talking about Grand Seiko all day, um, and we can probably have a future episode on that <laughs> brand, actually. But getting back to travel, um, I'm going to go to the Pikes Peak race with Tag Heuer this weekend. Zoom, um, zoom, zoom. Colorado. What do, you, what, do you, what do you know about Pikes Peak, Bilal? Because this I, is going to be a Pikes Peak education for you. I have barely any knowledge, but I will give a full update on our next podcast. Now, is this a moto race or is this a car race? Car race, I believe. Okay. As opposed to what? Oh, like a motorcycle? Uh, uh, like a motorcycle race, yeah. I, I, I wasn't dry. I know, like, the, the famous 
it's essentially like an uphill time trial in cars. Uh, yeah, like it's, it's, I think it's, it's the most famous um, race in the U.S. that isn't like on a traditional like round track or you right, know, like for, right. for Formula yep. One or Indy. Like, this is like yep, oh. just a point to point. Yeah, this is more like ra- I think they're called ra- these are like rally cars. Sorry, my 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 ability to differentiate different types of races is, <laughs> is limited, admittedly uh, limited. But it's supposed uh, to be thrilling, Bilal. Yeah, no, I'll be thrilled. I want you to That's choose it. a driver and a team, and you, I want you to root like a crazy fan. I was going to do that, yeah. Like paint so your face, Tag the Heuer hat. Tag sponsor the race, or do they sponsor a driver? Do we know? We Tag Heuer know. now sponsors everything. Between Tag yeah. Heuer and Ublo and Zenith, sure. I think that uh, LVMH okay. wants to yeah, sponsor everything on the planet, including, including, I think, retroactively, my high school graduation from um, the year 2000. <laughs> They've mm-hmm. gone back and they've altered the pictures, and now it's sponsored by Tag Heuer. I don't know how they managed to do I'm that. Just, but... I'm just waiting for the Tag Heuer X Flamin' Hot Cheetos rematch, and then and then I'm done. I'm out. Not for that. <laughs> Could you imagine like going through like your own pictures of like your your own history and looking at like something like that, and you recognize like there's like a luxury brand, like a watch brand, sponsoring something you never noticed it. You're like, oh my god, no idea that Tudor was uh, sp- <laughs> sponsoring my high school dance. That's so weird. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> Well, that should be uh, that should be fun, Bilal. I'm gonna. I, I had to pass on that one, unfortunately, but I'm gonna. I'll live vicariously through you, so it looks like it should be a good time. Zach, where are you going? Anywhere? Uh, do we have you going anywhere? Or do we? Know, uh, do, we do we need to take you anywhere? Well, I've got a. I've got a <laughs> got a personal trip coming up in July. We're headed to uh, to Mexico. Do a little bit of a uh, little bit of R and R, maybe some diving. I'm not sure. We'll be kind of on the east side of the uh, the Baja Peninsula, but I know. Excuse me, on the west side of the Baja Peninsula, but I know in the Sea of Cortez on the west side near La Paz, there's um, amazing, amazing diving. I'm kind of trading some emails with a uh, an outfitter based out of Cabo, and uh, it's Mobula season, so we'll see how uh, see if I can get in the water for some of that. Should we be need, cool. We, I mean, look, honestly, I don't know about you, I get so nerdily excited about taking a, wa- a watch underwater. <laughs> like oh my god i can't wait to see what the dial looks like like you know two feet under my it doesn't matter how deep you go you get the full experience at like a foot or two right it uh, does kind of you know it, it does kind of feel like doing the thing that the thing was intended for it's you know it's like riding a mountain bike on proper single track it's like riding a road bike on some like ripping section of like curvy you know asphalt that's freshly paved it's like it's just using like the right tool for the job there's, there's and something they be- super and they behave fun. differently what's that different watches behave differently underwater this is very the way, true the yeah. way light yeah. hits the yeah. dial it's 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 a different experience and i think you and i talked about this a real long time ago but but it's it's uh for 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 for, for a dive watch that's been truly purpose built um, it is really cool to use it and see it in the way that the designers imagined it or purposely designed it to be used. And and to your to, to your point about the way the dial reacts or the way the indices are are applied in such a way so that they catch light or um, you know the way the bezel is colored colored in such a way so that it can be visible at a certain depth. Like there are a lot of really interesting traits to watches that truly come alive when they're in the correct environment. And I think like. You wouldn't see that unless you actually kind of put it to use, which is super yeah. neat. Yeah. And for the listeners who probably don't know this, you guys met on a dive trip with yes. Oris. Yes, was it? that's like correct. Two years ago. Yeah. So this is Zach was, was a lucky time. winner. We, Zach and I got our <laughs> diving certification together. Now yeah. we actually have to go back in the water. You know what, Zach? I was I was thinking. That idea where somebody wins the ability to go diving and get their diving certification, I think that was successful enough to do that again. I think so too. Yeah, I absolutely think so. I mean, I think, that, that uh, was good for the brand. I think I mean, Boris got some great content out of it. I think you guys got a few <laughs> cool stories out of it. I got an amazing piece of my summer out of it. So, <laughs> how, how, so let me ask you a question. I mean, obviously, Oris was connected to this. And uh-huh. I, I go on the theory that if you have an emotionally impactful relationship with a brand or while wearing a brand or something like that, you have kind of, I don't want to call it permanent, but you have a much stronger emotional bind uh, to that to that brand. You're going you're gonna to like it a little bit more. Do you have a special relation with, with with Oris now after that? You know, it's funny. I do, actually. And when I saw, you know, we ran into, uh, ran into VJ in the halls whenever I see, you know, any, any, anyone else kind of on his team. 
um, at the events or, you know, kind of down the road. Um, there is always like, a, oh, hey, you're the guy or, oh, hey, you're the, I mean, there, there is an absolute affinity and, and it goes beyond the personal connections with the, the brand's physical staff, but also within kind of my watch box, I've got a, um, I, I took an Oris, uh, that regulator uh, that they made, the, the single kind of decentralized minute hand uh, dive watch. On that trip, I was actually an Oris owner at the time of the trip, and uh, I took that with me, dove with it. Uh, we wore all kinds of cool watches uh, throughout that week there, but um, that's an extremely kind of memorable piece. And, uh, you know, when we talk about imbuing watches with memories and kind of the best ones and the pieces that sort of stick around in your collection are usually the ones that you've done the coolest stuff with. Yeah. Um, that that experience has absolutely endeared me, not just to the brand, but to to that particular watch in my watch box, which is super cool. So definitely a keeper. So Bilal, speaking of dive watches, you wrote, a very exhausted look at oh, yeah. the Planet Ocean, the Seamaster, yeah. the Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean. This is, it's always been challenging for me to even describe this collection because I, it, like the best case scenario, I'm like, it's one of many Seamasters that Omega That's makes. exactly <laughs> the issue that I had when I was about to start this piece. I was like, there's so many fragmented pieces of information about the Planet Ocean. Um, They've had so many iterations and models and updates, um, which is actually why I really admire the collection. It is not beholden to history at all. Um, mm -hmm. It was introduced in 2005. Um, they've had three generations of it. Um, this article that I wrote, you know, it's the longest article I've ever written. Um, it took a very long time, but it was a satisfying task. Um, I personally am wearing my my personal Planet Ocean at the moment, and it is just oh so comfortable. <laughs> no, Bilal, you did a really good job with this piece, and I think I, I've I've long been um, a Planet Ocean fan. I've, it was actually one of the first. Uh, it was the first nice watch that I ever owned, actually. And um, so I've been I've been following it from not 2005, probably a little bit later than that. And so when I heard that you were working on this piece, having been kind of a fan and followed all, all of the iterations, and I know all the different permutations and stuff of it. I was one, I didn't envy the the task that you'd set in front of you. But two, I was I've been pretty eagerly awaiting this story for a very long time. Uh, and I think you did a, a really good job with it. Yeah, well, I, th I think, you know. The Planet Ocean for me was not a not a watch that for a long time I thought about because I don't think I ever really understood it. Omega never kind of like pulls anyone aside and aside and says this is the way to understand the the Planet Ocean. One no. of the first things I found amusing was that okay, so you have the Seamaster, and the Seamaster is like uh, well. The the, wa the watches that just have Seamaster in the name as opposed to a bunch of other stuff. That's like Omega's like tool style dive watches and the um, the Seamaster 300M is probably the most iconic one but since then they've come out with the Seamaster Seamaster 300M Seamaster 300 without the M mm -hmm. Seamaster Planet Ocean and a lot of stuff in between that <laughs> and, oh, and, then, and then of course there's the Aquaterra and what's interesting is the Aquaterra and the Planet Ocean have the exact same name it's just different language Aquaterra and Planet Ocean both literally just mean Planet <laughs> Ocean so mm -hmm. I think it's interesting they have two watches in the collection with the exact same name, but just in two different languages. Uh, it gets a little bit weirder because the new uh, Railmaster is also technically a Seamaster, and if you look at it on their website, it is the Seamaster Railmaster, and I wish I was making this up, and no, I'm not drunk. It's No, you're not. You remember the yeah. Bullhead Chronograph that was like a racing watch? Same. That was also <laughs> in the Seamaster collection. Made no sense. Yeah. 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 Part of why I like the Planet Ocean is that it does is that Omega can sometimes spend too much time talking about its history. So there's the Railmaster and the 1957 trilogy and the, obviously the Speedmaster and all this, that sometimes I feel like they have neglected in telling the story of their contemporary watch, which is the, mm -hmm. the, the Planet Ocean. Um, and that was the impetus for why I sought out to, to 
to really have one cohesive story of this watch because I couldn't find it anywhere. You know they're waiting to the 2030s to start talking about it. You know that. (laughs) It's going to be the 25th anniversary of the planet ocean. Will they even mention 2005 for the first time? The 15th anniversary. They'll do something for the 15th anniversary. You know they're going to. That'll be, what, that's two years out? Right? Yeah, that'll be 2020. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, the thing the thing that's unique about this this particular collection and below, you made a great you touched on this well in the article. So, you know, if you're listening and you haven't read the article, uh, this breathe is the spoil article. A bit, but breathe the article first. in the show notes. Um, but really, the 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 punchline is that um, it, it's it's incredibly unique when every other watch brand out there, you know, has. Uh, something in their collection right now that is harping on some moment in history or really just kind of riding some coattail from a long time ago. And I think the thing that's unique about this particular watch and the collection as a whole is that, yeah, I mean, it they, it took very baseline inspiration from the early Seamaster 300s and sort of the 12369 uh, dial, the layout, but, you know, and the twisted lugs. But for the most part, it with it being as unique as it is, um, it's kind of given the designers creative reign to design something kind of from the ground up um, and then continue to iterate on it. And and whether you like it or not, you know, the, the fact that Omega is constantly tweaking and constantly iterating, um, one, you know, on one side of the coin, it's nice because it, it yields a, a spectrum of, of watches where there is something for everyone, essentially. But on the other side... You know, <laughs> you get uh, your, your watch can be quickly outdated. You know, when they when they fiddle with the knobs a little bit too much. But yeah. um, it is it is unique. Yeah, I kind of see it as the opposite of the of the sub, which is you know, yeah. you've gotten one change in the past fifty years basically. <laughs> Whereas if you buy a Planet Ocean, you know that within a couple of years it's going to be the old model, mm-hmm. but it's that kind of um it's a different kind of a luxury product because you don't care because you're probably going to be interested in that next one yeah and to be fair like you know i i feel like iwc there there are other brands that have had a singular like we take dive watches for example there are other brands that have had a singular dive watch that they messed with the formula too much you look at the aqua timer the the original well not the original the um, the late '90s, late '90s, early aughts version of uh, the 3719, essentially. So that's the only reference number that I'm going to drop in this podcast. Hopefully, um, you know that was the the uh, the internal rotating bezel variant, which uh, took a little bit of inspiration from some of their earlier models, but for the most part was an original sports watch. Um, and it was followed up three or four years later by something that was pretty dramatically different, had an external bezel, totally different vibe. Um, and then that was that was further tweaked and messed with with the latest uh, version of the Aqua Timer, which we're seeing now. Rumor has it that there's another Aqua Timer permutation coming in 2019 from from SIHH. Right. And that and makes me kind of wonder, like when you compare the Aqua Timer with the Planet Ocean, the Planet Ocean has still maintained a relatively singular design language throughout. Yeah. But all three generations of it are pretty dramatically different from a from a movement standpoint, from a technological standpoint, and that's another thing that the article does a really good job of kind of breaking down the differences. Let me let me, let me bring a few things here um, into this conversation. Thing are important. The hour markers in the hands of the Planet Ocean. In fact, a lot of elements are directly related from watches that Omega made for the most part in the 1960s. Yes. So Correct. these these are not. <clears throat> To call it a to call it a modern it, watch is yeah, true. It, it is very much, true, but with old a, skin and old skin, so to say. Yeah, and that was the original design mm. language when it comes to the hands and the hour markers. Um, but it works also, well. It works yeah, well. It, I have to great. say, it doesn't. Even though this is one of many watches that Omega produces that, like I said, have a vintage-looking skin, but a modern watch. This one, for me, looks the most modern. It always has. It always felt the like a watch of today. The escape valve is the real um, the vestige of <laughs> old school watches. Um, it's a little... I mean, I don't love it, to be honest. I, it's You know what it is? It'd it's be weird like, if they got rid of it at this point, because it would be such a drastic change. Cindy, but Cindy Crawford was an Omega brand ambassador, right? Are you going to talk about her mole? I'm going to talk about her mole. <laughs> okay. I think that this this is 
maybe they were inspired by it. This is her. This is a watch. This is her mole on a watch. You're saying that the valve was inspired by the mole on Cindy Crawford's face. I I have no evidence to suggest that it is, but I have evidence to suggest that it serves the same purpose. It's an added element that adds a little bit of extra recognizability that you don't really need to be there. It doesn't serve any actual purpose. Okay. Well, I'm going to take this opportunity to move on to our main topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wasn't going to touch to the planet either. ocean and in to <laughs> Cindy Crawford in a way, which is a modern icon. What are, are the modern icons of watches? Um, I came up with this topic when I was thinking of the planet ocean. You know, it's a watch that was introduced in 2005, but it, it feels like it's an institution now. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've talked about the Planet Ocean a bunch. Um, Zach, you mentioned the Aqua Timer. I know that yeah. you've really got a fondness for a certain era of this watch, but have in recent for years. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of preempted it a little bit by saying that, um, you know, IWC, I think, fussed with it a little bit too much uh, to, to make it a true. I feel like it could have been a modern icon, and right now it's. Because because it hasn't maintained a singular design language, where you look at it from twenty yards away and say, "Oh yeah, that's an aqua timer." Whereas with the Planet Ocean, you can see it from twenty yards away and say, "Oh yeah, that's a Planet Ocean." Partially because some of them are so large, you can see them from twenty yards away, but that's beside the point. Oh, zinger! <laughs> come on, zinger! Just dropping <laughs> zingers. Now, so with the uh, with the aqua timer though, it, without kind of a singular design language, um, I feel like they've. They missed what could have been a modern icon, and in my mind, I think the most iconic is the 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 ones that did come around in the early two thousands when IWC had all of that borderline, um, you know, all the politically incorrect advertisements. Ariel, you probably remember these. There's, I really enjoyed those. <laughs> probably wasn't a bright spot for the brand. I know when Kern came in, he he that was that was kind of one of the first things he it, mixed. It's funny. What it's been, Oh, I'll probably about Brightling. I think it's talking about IWC. I'm sorry. He did the same, but he did the same thing at IWC. He cut but those out too, though. Nobody misses those. Yeah, nobody misses those advertisements. But but they come from an era when, from a design standpoint, Speak I feel like IWC was hitting everything. <laughs> they were, uh, uh, you know, the the pilots line was was firing, um, and the aqua timers were just like. Uh, they were just they were just really pure from a design standpoint. They felt like they carried the DNA from the uh, the originals, the mid-century, and uh, you know the ones from the '60s, right. and um, and and iterated them on just enough to make them look and feel super modern. Um, and then I feel like the the versions that followed um, just just went a little bit too far. Okay, so you and I, you and I agree that the Aqua Timer has failed to become a modern icon, but I agree. think that it's because IWC has gone to the extra length of actually experimenting like it's easy to take something that works and just tweak a little bit and that's what rolex does right they're like this works let's just tweak a little bit and they've done it more successfully than anyone else with that said i personally give credit to iwc at least when they come to their dive watches of changing it up all the time it's definitely true that like i look at a new generation model and say to myself even though i love new stuff i'd rather have an old generation that may happen <laughs> But I still like yeah. the fact that they're trying because I think that at the end of the day, no amazing watch comes out unless someone tries something new. You have to try something new for there to be something uh, amazing and novel. And yeah. when yeah. a brand even tries, I mean, the fact that they keep changing up their dive watch again and again and again, that shows that they generally aren't giving up. And so I think that, that that's sort of the other side that people don't give um, IWC enough credit for. Omega... I mean, look, even within the, the dive watches they make that are excellent, there's always versions that are just, I don't want to call them unsellable, but you'll see some color combination to be like, <laughs> I don't know who you had in mind for this, Omega. Um, I'm, it's like, is this just a watch that you wanted to make so you could take pictures of it? You know, like there's certain things out there, but they're experimenting like crazy. And, you know, right now yeah. on the screen, there's the, there's a blue ceramic version of the, the Planet Ocean. That might be... The blue. Well, okay, the, well, that might go over really well. That might go over super well. But, you know, if you so, have, like, well, a, a meeting, like a product meeting, and everyone's like, oh, blue ceramic case, I, there's no evidence to show what the sales in that are. No one has any idea. Well, they did but create do, that once the deep black models uh, had some success. So I think 
the trajectory was all ceramic cases for the planet ocean or they've got some kind of an audience. Um, but I agree in that IWC did experiment with the aqua timer and there should be some credit that mm -hmm. they get for that, even if they didn't succeed. Because, you know, we're saying the, that the planet ocean is a modern icon and yeah, they've, they have iterated and created new models. I mean, I found out about pieces that I haven't even seen. Mm -hmm. the, the black and white GMT, which I call the cookies and cream. That's it's not my favorite, guess. but, you know, <laughs> some people love it, some people don't. But there's hits and there's misses. Um, I don't inherently think that the that experimenting should strip the watch of a modern icon status, but I think there is. I think the Aqua Timer is on um, a shakier ground here. Right. Well, I think I th I think it's important to recognize to to become an icon to be iconic. I mean, by definition, implies you know some undetermined amount of time. I mean, it, it's time. Time is the, the secret sauce here, right? And, and the, the, the initial, um, I guess, sort of temptation with designing new products and continually giving out products for your, your customers to buy every year is, is to continually take that thing that you want to become iconic but like you also want to be able to sell new products and so you 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 mess with it a little bit and i think where and this is you know what i think the the article kind of touches on and also what's endeared me to the planet ocean is that omega has has maintained what i think to be a, a, a fine balance of tweaking the knobs just a little bit to enable the watch to become iconic without turning it all the way to 11 and flipping the design on its head and creating something entirely new. Now, this is to say with the Aqua Timer, I, I think there's three completely different Aqua Timers. And all three of them, honestly, are, are pretty cool. Um, I prefer the original, you know, or not the original, the the, the earlier, the earliest of the three that we're talking about. But I, I think those are three fundamentally different watches. Whereas with the Planet Ocean, we've got three generations that... Um, maintain just enough design and integrity from the outgoing model to one push it into a new generation with either um, you know their liquid metal tech with uh, the the movement technologies they're putting in there with the case design with the ceramic everything brings something a little bit new to the equation without completely knocking over um, you know the foundation that has been established so I think that's why the the planet ocean can can be called iconic after 15 years, almost 15 years, whereas the Aqua Timer, they're pretty much just hitting the reset button on it every four years, and I think right. um, that's why it's not going to be an icon, at least until they, they settle on, on some kind of design. The Cartier Sorry, you know, I, I, I like Caliber Diver. Stuff. Cartier Caliber Diver. I believe, okay. I, I, I don't know for sure, because I hear conflicting information. My understanding is that Cartier is stopping it altogether or slowing down. I was a fan of this collection. It was not an amazing success for them. I liked it a lot. Um, what do we think about that one? Just because that's for me. Do they still produce it? I then I don't I I again I've heard I've heard things like they're winding it down. Like I've it's heard no it's like, out as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think they had a hard time understanding who is the buyer for this watch and marketing it as such. I think in terms of design, I like it a lot. Um, would I necessarily be an owner? Probably not. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate the watch for for yeah. what it is and or was. If we figure I, that, out. I liked it too. I I felt like it was a little bit too much of like a Porsche Cayenne type of a scenario where um, you can't well, you can't it, be it all things small. to all people. And like I appreciate. You thought the it fact. was like a Porsche Cayenne, really. No, but no, well, but I mean it's 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 trying to inject uh, capability or or some off brand personality where I I don't I mean, but the Cayenne's done the Cayenne essentially saved Porsche. I mean that's been a, a phenomenally successful model for them. So I I don't I don't I'm honestly surprised that this didn't take off. Um, I mean Cartier but, did absolutely no marketing of, and of any kind to suggest that they had a real dive watch. Yeah. And I, I think that's what's <laughs> going to keep it from being a modern icon. You know, it's... The, when you stop it's, making it? 
<laughs> that, yeah. Um, but just to go back for a second, you know, we're talking about 2005, which is when the the Planet Ocean came out. Another watch that came out in 2005 was the Hublot Big Bang, mm -hmm. um, which I think we can all agree. Even though one of the first things people will say about it is that it's a um, highly inspired style, as in not original necessarily. The Big it's Bang become an icon. Yes. What does the what? Okay. What does the Big Bang look like when you see the you Big think Bang? It looks like Royal Oak. How? How? Like one is there? I I mean, if like if you're yes. if you're like a sun if you're like there's a silhouette and both of them are like riding to you. And, and there's a sun behind them, and you can't really tell, and it's kind of blurry. Maybe the silhouette would look the same a little bit, but other than that, I, I, I personally see no, like, n no familiarity. Do they share certain design things? Yeah, but in no way more than so many other watches do. I, I, I personally don't see it. I'm not denying that someone else sees it. I've never seen it. I think it's more apparent on, on the simpler models. Um, I mean the countersunk screws. The, I mean the, the bezel's round versus octagonal, but like uh, it, it's really the screws. I mean the, the the screws are where the resemblance is drawn. I think, um, and you don't really see that result because so many of the big bangs just go so wildly out there. But to your point, Bilal, I would agree that like you could look at any big bang that was released in the last decade um, and at a glance know exactly what it was without being like, oh, that's not a big, you know, because they all sort of have the same, they all have the screws, they all have kind of the same case uh, shape, the dimensions are relatively similar, but... Um, so but we do why agree... Do we why do we talk... Would be a modern icon. It is, because... it is. I mean, I wrote an article, I don't remember the name of it, but it was talking about... Um, I think it was a Living Legends article, and I talked about what are some Living Legend watches are still produced, and the Royal Oak and the Reverso and stuff like that are in there, and 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 I talked about this. So we were we were I thought we were talking about like uh, these types of classic dive watches. We ended up just talking about Omega and IWC. Was there a reason that we sort of focused just on those brands, or the other ones that? Because I mean, there's, this conversation going for like 30 hours. We're just bringing up like little independent brands with their divers and icons well, and things like that. Go on forever. I don't think all the independent watches that you might be thinking of would would necessarily be elevated to modern icon status. I think that's the 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 challenge of a watch that's been introduced in you know the past 15, 20 years is a lot of them do not end up being, you know, yeah, a line that is as cemented as a line that's been around for 60, 70 years. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, that's the difference between uh, the Planet Ocean and the Reverso, which the Reverso or the Submariner, those are designs that have legitimately been along for the last, you know, 50 or whatever years, whereas this one literally came along uh, in this last generation when a lot of watch fans who have just started following the industry or following or started collecting in the last decade um, have basically had a front row seat to watching a, a, a product come new from inception um, and, and begin that long journey towards, so, again, this is, you know, very subjective territory and icon status, but like, I just, to Ariel, to your point, I, I don't think there are that, actually that many products that fit this. I mean, there are a lot of interesting independents that have come along um, probably within the same time frame, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I couldn't think of any that have stuck around for as long as, as yeah. the ones that we're talking okay, about. Okay, so let me ask this question. Richard Why... is probably a brand that I would consider to be a modern icon because sure. they were, yeah. they, they came along in 1999, 2000. And I mean, as a brand, they've got the same cachet as, you know, the oldest brands in watchmaking. The same but cachet? They, you think so? I mean, they achieved... I mean, I would put the Richard Mille brand in the top, 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 top um, echelon of brands. I think Lock collector uh, appreciation and consumer willingness to pay are two slightly different things. Elaborate, because I don't know which point you're putting on Richard Mille. So Richard Meal is a brand that has demonstrated it can get people to pay for it, meaning it's strong in sales. But it's Richard iconic. Meal. Richard Meal, like like people know what Richard Meal is. Yeah, but you're talking about a certain type of, I guess, acknowledgement or respect from 
you're saying like it's acknowledged as an upper echelon like is it the same type of watch or is it a different type of product i i i I'm I saying it, that it is category. as iconic of a brand as other brands that have been around for a century. I, I may, maybe I'm sort of splitting hairs at this point, but for me, Icon is something which has been around and is, is, is well known for what it is, is a high degree of identifiability. As I think by that definition, that could work, though. I mean, it does have a high degree of, uh, of I would, recognizability. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. So, so, that's, so that's good. But I think Icon is also something where there, there is a certain degree of broad awareness. Now, I think the, the icons that we talk about are able to maintain an awareness. And what Richard Meal has not proven yet, because it's relatively new, is that it can maintain what it's good at doing for several decades. It might be able to. But it simply hasn't demonstrated it yet. The longevity of it, I agree with, but there's no way to measure that for what we're talking about in terms of a, a modern icon. But what we can say is that in a few short years, it has reached a status and a, and, um, a brand recognition that is nearly impossible to do in such a short frame of time. I agree to that, sure. I would agree with that as well. And that's a modern icon, in my opinion. The Planet Ocean, there's so much competition in terms of that price set for a luxury dive watch. To stand out and to become what it is now is a difficult feat. But can I ask why we care about icons in the first place? Like, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm I just asking think, why. I think it's, you know... We, we all see how many new watches and iterations of watches are introduced. And my frustration with a new line of watches is that they're always a reissue or a reimagination of a vintage piece. Mm -hmm. And my frustration of that has led to the point where I really was thinking, I'm like, what watch lines are there, or brands in this case, that don't do that, that yeah. aren't are, that you know are trying something new. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I think it's the perfect counterpoint to the the vintage reissue trend. That's like you know, I mean, at this point, somebody oh, you have another thirty eight millimeter diver from nineteen sixty four. Like, uh, cool. You lost <laughs> it. It kind of elicits an eye roll at this point. Whereas, you know, Bilal is of the mind, and I'm of the mind. Where at this point, it's like I you know, I want to see something new. I want to see I want to see how the envelope gets pushed a little bit. Yeah. I, again, so I, I like looking for what I call undiscovered icons. I like finding things that, that other people don't like. When I like a watch and what someone else does it. But I don't, I think, an un, I think undiscovered and icon, I don't think those words are, I mean, those are, those are yin and yang there. I don't, I don't no, think I, I, something <laughs> undiscovered can become an icon. See, an yeah, icon okay. requires a certain amount of popularity. Things can become popular sure. long after they come out. Right. I'm an icon in the wings. Right. Well, <laughs> okay. So a watch that I would certainly put in this category is the Grand Seiko Snowflake, the SBGA211. That watch came out in 2010, and I think it is a modern icon. I think watch enthusiasts love this watch. I think it's certainly Grand Seiko's most desirable watch. Mm -hmm. Um I think the combination of the spring drive movement and the dial with its, you know, pretty subtle texture that, you know, is supposed to look like freshly fallen snow. Um, I think it looks more like a uh, textured paper, but the subtlety yet, you know, intriguing, um, uh, the palette of that dial with the blue hands and the, t the, the, titanium case and bracelet and the price it's has not, made people no. completely fall we have in to, love we actually have to write an article it, about the snowflake we've I never hope. actually written an article about it so to draw on a musical reference here then like ariel you're you're all you're looking who's the next arcade fire so if ariel okay. were if ariel were a music manager or a talent scout he'd be like i'm always i'm on the lookout for like who's Who's the national right now? They're just playing like they're just playing clubs. They're playing bars, but they're gonna be huge. They're gonna yeah. be like a stadium rock band yeah. for the ages. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what you're looking for at the moment. And I think I think to your point, Bilal, I think the I would agree that the snowflake 
um, is very much like an indie band who is big, has a big indie following, but hasn't quite made the transition into stadium rock yet. Yeah. And with Grand um, Tango, they're never going to be stadium rock, you know? Like, they're, they're I, only going to be... And I think they're pushing there. <laughs> well, just their production numbers, I think. Oh, that's true. And, yeah, that's true. you know, the it the price for it is $5,800. And I can't find a used one for less than, like, 5000 or 4800 So, like, really not that much of a discount from the... We're still talking about the Snowflake? Yeah, we're still talking about the Snowflake. You know that I can't stop thinking about is the Snowflake. Because Seiko uh, actually had a ha, had a, a plaque that demonstrated how the dial was produced, where they had a typo that actually said Snowflake. Uh, so this I, is this is my first experience actually seeing the Snowflake with yeah. them calling the Snowflake, and it's it's amusing <laughs> to say the least. I think of the Snowflake as the perfect um, parallel, but in like a contemporary way to the Datejust. Which is a watch I would never wear, really, be- just because I, I, it doesn't make any sense for me. Like I just don't see myself wearing it. But for a time and date watch that is a dress watch that can be pretty flexible in how you choose to wear it, I think the Snowflake is the modern. Uh, okay, I have a, I have a theory about the Snowflake, and you guys can feel free to dismiss it. But this is my theory about its popularity. Do you want to hear it? You can tell us. Okay, <laughs> you're like I'm about to say no to this, Ariel, but you can sounds tell like it. we're about to get it either way. So. <laughs> okay, okay. One of the things that most Grand Seiko watches lack is a name other than a reference number, and a lot of watch lovers, not just Zach, are allergic to reference numbers, right? Because there's no personality wh- whatsoever. Seiko, <clears throat> not just Grand Seiko, has had a pretty good long history of enthusiasts making names for specific watches. Um, the Monster, for example, or the Tuna. These are all some of many, many names that people have come up with. This has not been Seiko doing it. Seiko themselves know something interesting, and that is when the community creates a name for one of their watches, it sells more sure. because there's a personality associated with it. Now, the Snowflake is a watch that is produced with other dials other than this particular dial that that is white and has a little bit of a texture to it that you know, resembles, uh, as you said, uh, snow. My theory is that because this version of the watch that has other dials has a name, it sells more because people remember that than other ones. The fact that, that it has enough personality to give it a name that it does makes people remember and reach for it more, whereas they would just be happy, just as happy with the same model, but just with any other dial. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't right, disagree with that. that. I mean, no, there have been some really incredible dial variations with that similar case and that movement uh, execution that didn't get those names and thereby like there's no way in hell I'm going to be able to remember the reference number for this obscure watch that I saw on a forum a year ago whereas that I mean that that is a good point I don't disagree with that I think the confluence of the product and how it's been branded and perceived online like especially on like Instagram, like I see tons of posts about the snowflake. I think it definitely has create like all these things have come together to create what is a modern icon. Yeah, like so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go here. Uh, this is an article that we came out with a few months ago. This is a limited edition, probably Japan only, that had. I'm trying to see what else ones here because Seiko has no shortage of interesting dials. They really don't. But I don't know that. Any of these dials have a name, you know, similar to Snowflake, and I really do believe because because the Grand Seiko look isn't that different watch to watch. Don't get me wrong; they have plenty of little variation, but it's like Dauphine hands, basically the same types of hour indicators. Uh, you know, one of a few movements, and you know, is it like what's sexier to say like the Snowflake or in this case here this other one, the SBGT two four one? Like it's, you know, the. the Seiko and a lot of other brands, they need to give their watches like names. Sure, but um, if they did it with every watch, I don't think it would be as effective. I, I do think you're you are right in that. Oh, well, they snow can't. They can't do it with every watch. Thing. It's impossible. They can't do it with every watch. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, look at look at Panerai. I mean, Panerai has they have collections. They have the Luminor, the Radiomir. Um, but every Pam is a reference number, which which turns my hair white and. Um, it it also 
creates a distinct lack of personality in each individual model. Um, and that's, I think, what, what I've struggled with, with with the brand, with Grand Seiko, uh, whereas uh, with without something to, to distinctly remember and associate myself with, it's just, yeah, nothing, nothing tends to stick around. I have endeared myself to Panerai after after some level of like research, but I, I also think with, with Panerai, they have they've created sub collections. So granted, they do have all these numbers, but like you're either a radio mirror, you're a luminor, you know, or you're one of the you know 1940 case, 1950 case, whatever. There is still to a certain degree some segmentation there, where at, at which point you pick a collection, you're basically just picking a dial color. Whereas with Seiko, all of these. With Grand Seiko, all these variants are are pretty dramatically different pieces, I would say, um, especially yeah. with the dial variations that we're talking about. Where I mean, there's a lot of really cool uh, textured, and I mean, Ariel, there's a okay. So that that GMT watch that you have, did you know there's like a there's a super rare blue dialed version of that? Again, reference number be damned. Um, that's just absolutely gorgeous. Japan only limited, but again, no quirky nickname. Um, I can't remember that reference number to save my life. So it's a matter of like doing some obscure image search to track it down. But like, I mean, it is, it is, it is a very good point that even from a collection standpoint, that that GMT watch doesn't have an explorer like name. No, it's just, it's, it's the SBG, you know, here we go. Was it the, the 201 G? <laughs> and I think these are actually slightly different uh, numbers now. Like I think Grand Seiko actually changed some of their reference numbers. I don't remember these, le- these letters at the end of it. Like yeah, they like, changed they changed the reference numbers when the when they rebranded after last year. So the references boy, changed. And they started the adding this stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> it literally on their website it says new for this model. I'm like, this model's not new. <laughs> <laughs> Great watch, so not new. So um, what else? Ariel, what are your suggestions for a modern icon? Have you given one? Oh, I have to give a suggestion for a modern I'm- icon. Can you not think of one? What's your undiscovered <sighs> arcade sucks. fire right now? Yeah. I don't even know what arcade <laughs> fire Chanel is. J- well, we, oh my god, Ariel. <laughs> I really don't. The J12 is a watch that I think you did a podcast about it recently. Oh, yes. Or recently, and I think you were talking about it in a way that made it sound like you, you kind of see it as a modern icon. I had look. I mean, I have a lot of watches. I think are modern icons. I mean, look. I I think one of the ones that I would say the most is the Big Bang. I mean, I didn't. Yeah. I've written about this a lot. I think it has a lot of the things that go into it. I think, I think the Bell and Ross, the BR one, is a modern icon. Yeah, I was just gonna Absolutely. say Bell and Ross. I mean, very few brands have have been able to kind of take a singular design language and push it across three different collections, yeah. essentially. I think one of the things that we've seen, in especially in the late 90s and early 2000s, is watches coming out that are luxury watches that, that are, how should I say this, they're polarizing on purpose. You used to have watches that came out that were more for specific function and the design followed the, you know, the the the, the functionality and utility but more recently you had watches that were produced for a lifestyle and because it's produced for like one type of person someone that doesn't follow that lifestyle is going to be turned off by it and the Big Bang is exactly that it's a watch for certain lifestyles not all of them and if you're in that lifestyle you're like that's cool that's totally me if you're not in that lifestyle you're like what the hell is this why wasn't it made for me <laughs> So yeah. this notion of having modern icons that are just great on everyone, like a Submariner, this looks good on everyone. I don't really know that there's a market for that anymore. I think that the market now is really good for this demographic of people. Eh, this other group of people, this, they won't like it. It's too big. It's too small. Give them something else. So if you're saying there's not a market for it anymore, does that mean the Submariner is not selling anymore? No, <laughs> there's there's definitely a market. What I'm saying is... There's a market for what I call conservative watches, meaning it either has to be this long-standing yes. old conservative watch or it looks like it. Yeah. If you want to have something new that would fill the role of what the Submariner used to be, it would have to be dramatically different. And that's what actually the Omega Seamaster 300M was originally when it came out in the early 90s. It was the it was we want to have a, a mainstream all-purpose everyone likes it 
dive watch that isn't the Submariner. But that is already a watch that you know came out in the early 90s, so it's, it's a while ago. More recently, you have brands trying things all the time. And to be honest, when a lot of brands try something new, they just get panned. And they get panned because it doesn't look like something people are familiar with. I mean, Bilal, mm -hmm. remember we were in um, Basel. I think you two guys actually had the meeting without me first. And we went to Favre Luba. And Favre Luba had a, a three-hand version of their watch. I forget the name of it. Maybe it's Raid or something. Um, or the Raider Harpoon? The Harpoon, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not the one that has the, uh, the single hand and the turning disc. It's just a normal three-hand one with a Salida um, on there. So C, um, I'm forgetting the name, but yeah. 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 That watch takes an old look, cleans it up a little bit in a modern way. That is something – it's it's hard to call it modern icon because it does use a little bit of an old look, but it's it's a type of watch that could turn into something. The right type of visibility behind it, it has distinctiveness. Now, its ability to go from having an effective, unique look to being something that a lot of people want is a function of popularity. And how things become mm -hmm. popular are – it's got to get lucky. The right combination of people have to wear it. It has to be available in the right combination of stores. It has to be the right price. Sometimes these things become popular years after. I mean, I always like to tell the story that the Royal Oak, when it first came out, was yeah. not a popular watch. Sa yeah. Same thing with the Nautilus. When the Nautilus I'll came out, people were just like, Ugh, whatever. Yeah. And so we can't necessarily predict market factors that will combine to create something which is really iconic. I just go out there and I don't look to myself for like what I think will be popular. I ask myself, what's cool? And there is <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of really cool watches that came out in the past 20, 25 years that is on no one's radars. But if they were, everyone would rally behind them. Well, and that's that that definitely shows there's a, an immense wealth of, of untapped um, untapped watches, essentially, because I mean, again, going back to the Royal Oak or the the Nautilus, um, or even like the the Paul Newman. I mean, what made the Paul Newman iconic was that nobody nobody wanted them; they weren't selling, and then they disappeared. And then it was as soon as people couldn't have them readily, it was when they became they became valuable and, and associated with something. And I think that that kind of that goes to show. Similarly, with the uh, with the Royal Oak and with the Nautilus, and even with the Nautilus, like more recently, um, I remember like what three, four years ago, even when um, when you know the Nautilus with the white dial was pretty. I, I wouldn't say readily available, but like if you wanted a Nautilus, you could probably get a white dialed one pretty easily. And now, like the white dialed ones, I feel like command a premium over the blue because. Nobody wanted them. They were in more limited production, um, and thus, you know, increased scarcity. And and I think I think again, just going back to that, like that odd, you know, the the, the market determines the popularity and thereby the scarcity. And the scarcity is what ultimately feeds that that icon status that we're kind of talking about. So we're 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 close to the end of the show here, and we want to do something a little bit different. We want to do uh, a poll question. Uh, Bilal, what do we want to ask? So to start with, I think something that every watch enthusiast has an opinion on is what they think of in-house movements and whether they are overrated or not. I, this conversation has, you know, it's as old as watches themselves. <laughs> um, I think, um, you know, my answer to if in-house movements are overrated is absolutely. I think they create unnecessary price inflation for brand, unnecessary pressure for brand to create in-house movements that are untested. Um, I think there is something to, to be said for in-house movements. You know, like we handle tons of watches and sometimes I get sick of seeing the same movements at a, a value 7750, the same movements over and over again. But I think in-house has become this a bragging phrase that has um, been overhyped. What do you guys think? I wrote a really long article on this topic um, called How the Push for In-House Movements Ruined the Modern okay. Luxury Watch Industry. This was published <laughs> two years ago. A little scathing. Um, there is an undeniable emotional satisfaction to knowing that the movement inside of your watch is 
uh, a, is, is, was created for that watch. There's some pleasure in seeing the, the case and the movement goes together in some type of beautiful harmony. And that the movement you have is designed differently and might perform a little differently. There's, a, there's an interest there that we like. Um, Ultimately, I think that there's too many in-house made movements out there that they've really inflated prices a lot, like Bilal said. And I think that I you know, discussed in a lot of detail about this. I, I like that they exist. There's a lot of great things you know, related to the fact that someone makes their own movement, and it's a, it's a good thing. Um, should you not buy a watch because it doesn't have an in-house made movement, I would never let that stop anyone. Should you I pay, you know what I mean? Yeah, I I agree. I think um, I, I think it all boils down to kind of buy what you like. At the same time, I wouldn't buy something or, or hold a preference to something just because it's in house. I would take a further step back, and I think I think to me, um, having in house for the sake of having in house is is wrong. And I think um, creating your own movement either to solve a problem or to add value to the watch or to add. Um, a feature or like a real world practicality to something, a feature benefit set that wouldn't otherwise be available from like a stock or off the shelf movement. I think absolutely go after in house in that case. And I think like you know when you look at when you look at the the two eight two four, which does um, everything that you know justifiably any watch wearer could be perfectly happy with a two eight two four for the rest of their life. The you know, going going to the Omega example, I know that uh, you know, the relationship between Eta and Swatch, I mean it's not technically in house, but when you look at what Omega has done with uh, the coaxial movement, um, and particularly the innovations in like the the eight thousand plus um, line where like the the you know where they, they are legitimately um, anti magnetic, amagnetic essentially um, they have long power reserves. Some of the movements have a jumping hour hand, which is super helpful for for frequent travelers. I, that's always something that I look for: is you land in a new airport, you can pop the crown out, adjust the watch, and a snap without messing with the accuracy. So they're accurate. They're they're real world anti magnetic, um, and you can put it down for a weekend and pick it up on Monday, and it's still running. I mean, I, I feel like those are genuine uh, benefits, a true like levels of practicality that in that instance would push me towards, uh, in-house versus, uh, stock. And I think Zen has done a good job with their in-house movements as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. kind of messing with the Valaju formula, uh, with, you know, center mounted minute, uh, counter for the chronograph, which is easier to read. Um, I think that's a genuine benefit. So stuff, stuff like that, uh, gets me excited about in-house, but if it's just pretty for the sake of being pretty or in-house for the sake of being in-house, that, that gets a hard pass from me. Yeah. I agree. And Where should people uh, contribute their feelings to this matter? We're going to have a post up on the site that's going to be a recap of this podcast. And we're going to have a poll question in which you can weigh in, say yes or no. If it's overrated, of course, leave opinions and explanations of your thoughts. Um, just one more thing that I wanted to add to the in house conversation is that I found that the in house title has become a lazy way for people to sometimes act like snobs um yeah. and, and in the know. watch industry snobs <laughs> not the industry but the community community snobs uh, <laughs> and it's a little exhausting and i roll my eyes when someone's just like you know clearly just wants to be an asshole and they're just like well it's not in house blah, blah, blah. it's just like well look at everything else that they're doing great like mm -hmm. a reliable movement that is you know looks great it's polished and it's okay decorated well can I'm, still be great that's all I I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back to this notion of saying that there are so many watches out there that are desirable and almost no one can afford them all that when an enthusiast is presented with something that they don't have yeah. Rather than asking themselves, "Do I like it?" they think of reasons why they don't, so they don't feel bad about about not ha having it. I think this is a real effect, and I think yeah. that in order to keep ourselves kind of sane, each individual watch collector creates this like personal like you know list of things that all their watches need to have, and whether or not that's reasonable, we stick to it because it 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 narrows down the world of choices because otherwise <laughs> there's just too many things. I think one thing to ask the community is like. You know, there, there are very few brands where we somebody could actually choose in-house versus not with a singular brand. And I think Tudor is one such example. And so when you look at 
Uh, would you buy uh, an Etta Black Bay or an Etta Pelagos versus uh, an in-house, the MT uh, version of the Pelagos or the Black Bay? Um, which one and why? And I, I think when you look at Tudor and when you look at the added benefits of the new movements, um, I would still spring for the Etta. I think like the... the it's thinner, right? The... It's, well, it, I mean, it's thinner, but I just think that like from a um, yeah. the brand ethos of Tudor, it never... To me, that movement feels a little bit too in-house for the sake of in-house. And I've, I've heard, I mean, I've been subjected to these conversations where, oh, oh yeah, I'll get this Black Bay because it's in-house. And I'm like, why? Whole, <laughs> it makes no difference. The whole point difference. of Tudor. Yeah, the whole point of Tudor was to create an economical alternative, and in-house was never part of that conversation. And to be fair, like, they haven't inflated the prices like, uh, you know, one would maybe expect with an in-house uh badge but at the same time like i still think that fundamentally um it doesn't fit with with what that brand is to me i would say read read my long exhaustive article um on the, <laughs> the push for in-house movements from the, the water and luxury watch industry uh it's 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 good information explains a lot of interesting stuff everyone please subscribe to the spending time podcast on itunes or whatever your preferred podcast listening service is and also rate us ideally it's a good rating because that helps out everyone yeah. thank you so much for listening uh zach thank you for joining us Bilal, thank you for joining us yep and uh gentlemen we'll, we'll talk to you later all right take care guys Thanks.